question. Sean Clark serves as the National Director of Veterans Justice Programs in the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Veterans Justice Programs include health care reentry for veterans, which provides outreach and linkage to VA services for veterans reentering from prison, and the VJO program, which are all front of, which is the front end coming in to the courts. And they serve as a prevention orientation oriented component of the VA's efforts to end homelessness among veterans, and they facilitate veterans' access to legal services, et cetera. So um, I've known Sean for, since 2009, I think, when I met him at the VA committee in Washington, and it's been uh, wonderful working with him all over these years, and now he's heading this whole program, uh, and it's just a, a pleasure to have him back, and I'm excited that he is speaking for us. And so, He's also going to be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart with legal aid and trying to do something with them that I hope he will be addressing as well. And then Jim Canelli is the Network Homeless Coordinator for the VA healthcare system for three states, Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. The Network Homeless Coordinator serves as a primary contact with the Network for VA Homeless Programs. His responsibility includes oversight for all of these programs mental health programs, he's an advisory capacity to the network director for Vision 10 of the chief mental health officer. He's had numerous programs that he's worked on over the years, masters of social work for OSU and bachelors of art from sociology from OIS State, licensed independent social worker supervisor. I've also known Jim for a long, long time. He has been a countless partner. I think he's probably participated in almost every veterans conference I've ever put on over the multiple years. This is our ninth one. And so he's been just great to work with over the years. Thank you. And Gina Kikos, I think I'm saying that right? Kikos? Kisos? Kisos? They didn't have a phonetics up here. Is an independently licensed social worker, currently serves as a VJO specialist for Dayton VA works on these programs with the Greene County Veterans Treatment Court. I'm trying to sign Greene County up for stepping up, by the way, so they're close, they're close. All right, and um, re-entry planning for veterans who are incarcerated in ODRC as well. Graduated from a Anderson University with a BA in Mathematics and Sociology, University of Michigan School of Social Work with a master's degree. And we have one more. Myra Jenkins is there. Healthcare Reentry for Veterans Specialist based out of the VA Northeast Ohio Healthcare Cleveland system. They provide coverage for 14 state prisons and federal, one federal. Been employed since 2008, working in home-based primary care as an HCRV specialist. Before that, she was in the Batterers Intervention and Clinical Coordinator in Treatment Alternatives to Street Crime, also known as TASC, as many of you may recognize. She's uh, responsible for providing outreach, pre-release assessment services, linkages, and many other services for veterans released into the community. Bachelor of Social Work, Bachelor in Criminal Justice Reform from Gammon, uh, Master's in Science and Social Administration and uh, from Case Western, and is also a licensed independent social work supervisor. So you really have a pretty robust group here of very experienced folks who've worked for a long time in Ohio and with us and the efforts that we've made and have been, because of that, has made Ohio really a leader in this area. And I'm really excited that they're going to be presenting. And I, as you know, we have these conflict issues. So if the chief is not back by 2.30, well, one of you dismiss them for a break and then pick up promptly uh, at, uh, I think the break is from 2.30 to 2.45. And hopefully I'll be back after that. Take it away. Well, thank you, Justice Stratton, and pre really appreciate the partnership we've had with you over the years, and you and Justice Kennedy and uh, Justice Jackson, the, the partnership on this summit and including the VA uh, in this important issue. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, providing a very brief overview of um, our homeless effort, our effort towards homeless veterans, uh, and then we're going to uh, kick it over to the other team members that you had, and then the second piece of this session uh, will be talking, uh, uh, Sean Clark will be uh, addressing the VA's effort towards deflection, 
Uh, so this first half is not going to be so much about the deflection effort, but just kind of setting the stage. Uh, and the, uh, we'll go ahead and kick off the next slide there. Okay. So um, you can go ahead and kick through, go through this. So we're going to just do a very general overview of homeless services and the, VA, the effort that the VA is having, just to kind of help orient you. VA uh, healthcare, uh, which is what we're the offices we're from, um, has a central office where Sean Clark is from with the National Program Office, um, and the Vision office where I'm from, as well as Teresa Sickman, who is here as our uh, Deputy Network Homeless Coordinator. She's going to be helping with the uh, panel session. Um, we're from the Vision office, we're a regional role, and then the medical centers. And in Vision 10, we're uh, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. There are 11 medical centers, and we have representatives here from uh, uh, several of our facilities, as well as online. And I, I wanted to make a note that, that uh, it's great that we're able to have the virtual option for folks, because I think we do have some of our justice program staff from Indiana and, and Michigan, as well as other parts in Ohio that weren't able to attend here in person today. So thank you for that. Next slide. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, go through. So the VA's mission in a, in a nutshell here uh, for homeless veterans is that we want to not see the words veteran and homelessness together, right? I mean, everyone I think can agree that that shouldn't happen, but it does. And when it does, we want to do our best to uh, keep it short, uh, brief, rare, and non-recurring. So if anything we can do to prevent veterans from falling into homelessness, we want to do that. So very similar to the efforts on deflection with uh, veterans to the justice system, we want to deflect or divert veterans from homelessness if we can. Um, but uh, there's a number of resources that we have, and um, it's been a lot of effort uh, over the past uh, decade or so uh, to try and help reduce veteran homelessness and end it if we can. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about homeless veterans, um, I just want to point out two things here. So first, homeless has a very specific meaning um, uh, in, in these efforts. And when we talk about some of the data, we'll be looking at the numbers of homeless veterans. What we're talking about are veterans who are sheltered veterans. Those are uh, veterans who are uh, living uh, or residing in a place that is intended to support homeless individuals. So emergency shelters, transitional housing, uh, other kinds of situations. It can include uh, hotel and motels. So in Ohio, we have county service office funds that can help prevent, uh, provide uh, uh, veterans with access to hotels in an emergency. So that's the category of homelessness that we typically are talking about here in these numbers. And veterans um, is anyone who served in the military. So it doesn't have to do with their character of discharge when we're talking about the numbers. Now, character of discharge can impact eligibility for certain services. It certainly impacts their eligibility for healthcare services, but it can also have an impact on some of the other resources that are available to them. So veteran is, is uh, very broad and includes our uh, reserve and uh, National Guard members. Next slide. HUD has a definition for homeless as well, and HUD's definition is a little broader, um, and it includes the first two categories of those who are sheltered uh, in an emergency shelter or transitional housing and unsheltered veterans. Um, and I skipped that over there, uh, skipped that to the last slide. Unsheltered veterans would be individuals who are staying in a place not meant for human habitation. Streets, cars, abandoned buildings, things like that. These two uh, categories of veterans, sheltered and unsheltered, are identified by HUD as literally homeless. Um, and they are included in their annual point in time counts. So, um, and I'll talk about that in the numbers. Um, but the literal homeless veterans are who we typically are running into, who are working with. Additionally, the veterans could fall into uh, three other categories of homelessness, which also qualify for some services. So these could be veterans who are at imminent risk of becoming homeless within 14 days. They're gonna be evicted, they're gonna lose their housing. We may work with them to prevent them from becoming homeless or we may get them connected into the homeless system and get them access to services so that if they are homeless, we're moving them back into permanent housing as quickly as possible. The other categories are homeless under other federal statutes. That really has to do with the Department of Education uh, and uh, unaccompanied youth or families with dependent children. 
and how this, the education system captures those individuals as uh, those families as homeless in that system. And then the, third, the fourth category is fleeing or uh, uh, involved in domestic violence. So these are, are families that are uh, maybe treated, individuals may be treated differently than sheltered uh, homeless individuals through the domestic violence system. Uh, there's more details here, and we've got some uh, more specific information as a chart at the end of this slide deck uh, that can kind of go into these different categories a little more. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are the range of services that are available to the v through the VA. I can't go into all of these now, uh, but they include prevention services uh, through our uh, supportive services for veteran families program. These are contracted services that are provided by a community provider. They receive funds through a grant award, and uh, they can provide case management services as well as uh, transactional assistance, financial assistance with housing, uh, costs, utility, rent, uh, and other costs of, such as um, uh, taking care of uh, uh, child care situations and things of that nature. Um, we have outreach services, uh, including our homeless outreach uh, program and our justice programs, which um, we have many in, in the audience here through our justice program, who are doing outreach to veterans on the streets, in shelters, as well as in the institutions, uh, prisons and jails uh, settings. Uh, working with law enforcement, working with the courts. Those are all part of our outreach team and serve as a prevention uh, arm for the VA um, uh, when the veterans are not homeless. And then we have residential services, which are basically sheltered programs, uh, transitional housing, emergency shelter, safe haven type programs, where veterans may stay until we can get them into permanent housing. Uh, these are also contracted services. The VA is not providing that directly, but we provide funds to community partners that can uh, provide that sheltered service uh, to help support those veterans until we can get them permanently housed. And then finally, we have our permanent housing programs. Uh, our HUD-VASH program is the well, most well known. Uh, it's a case management program that partners with HUD to provide housing subsidy to veterans while the VA provides the case management services. Um, and then supportive services for veteran families, in addition to the prevention, they have a case management service for homeless veterans where they can help them move quickly into permanent housing. HUD-BASH and SSVF work very closely together in some cases, um, and we're finding that these are probably the areas that um, uh, most veterans are going to have long-term uh, uh, contact with the VA. We have also have some specialty services, and one I just want to point out is the Legal Services uh, for Veterans, which is a new grant through our justice program, um, and Sean may speak a little bit more about that uh, uh, later on. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so how, how are we doing? So we'll go ahead and go through. This is uh, what we want to talk about in terms of the point in time count. So I mentioned about the literally homeless veterans. Um, when we look at how many veterans are on the street, how many veterans in shelters, we do this annual count through HUD. Uh, it's conducted in January each year. And um, we've seen a great reduction in the homeless numbers since 20, 2010, uh, when we really were taking a, a concerted effort to look at those numbers and build up resources. So there's been over 55% decrease in veteran homelessness from 2010 to 20, uh, 2020, um, yeah, 2020. Um, 2020 is a number that's uh, is a year that's used because with COVID, the point in time counts were really impacted. Identifying homeless individuals in the community was much more of a challenge. Um, but tremendous uh, effort has been made, and we have a number of communities that have brought those numbers down and have developed some systems, uh, some processes that have really uh, contributed to um, uh, to what we refer to ending veteran homelessness, which means basically that the community has the resources and the strategies and the, and the processes in place to coordinate to when there is a veteran, they can move them into housing quickly and to try and keep the numbers down as, as low as possible. Not zero necessarily, but reduce it so it's, a, it's manageable and uh, fits into the rare, brief, and non-recurring. Uh, next slide. This just shows you uh, the progress that we've made from 2010 to 2022 and uh, shows you the numbers in, in different categories in terms of overall homeless veterans 
uh, sheltered and unsheltered numbers. So you can see the dramatic decline in all areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is kind of a comparison of the veteran decline in homelessness uh, compared to all homeless. And you can see that all homeless uh, from 2010 to 2022, it's almost a straight line. Um, <clears throat> With the veteran homelessness, it's much more of a decrease, and that has a lot to do with the resources and the coordination efforts that have happened uh, in the community. Uh, next slide. So uh, the, the numbers are, are reduced, are being reduced, but one of the things that we found even in time was there had to be some more because we continue to see those efforts. Uh, go ahead into the next slide, and I think we're going to skip through some of this. This has to do with what we refer to as coordinated entry. And coordinated entry, um, when we, we talk about the justice system, the homeless system also has is a, a, a makeup of all the different homeless providers in a community. Uh, shelter providers, outreach providers, um, service providers. Um, coordinated entry is a process where when individuals show up to a homeless system, either on the street or in a shelter, that you're looking at directing them to the resources that are gonna help move them out of homelessness and back into uh, permanent housing. Um, so coordinated entry is a process where you can um, ensure that the individuals have the highest needs are getting targeted for those resources and getting them to the right intervention, if you will, uh, to help them where they need to go. Um, let's go ahead and go through the next slide. I want to kind of zip through this, but this just goes, shows you a little uh, uh, example of what coordinated entry looks like. When you, have, when you don't have a coordinated entry system, it's sort of a first come, first serve. It's who might, might uh, show up at the right time to get whatever service may be available. With a coordinated entry system, no matter where they show up, no matter what door they enter, what agency they first have contact with, you try to help uh, develop a process where everybody is assessed in a particular way so that they're directed towards the right resource to help them with what their needs are. Not everybody needs uh, a high level of case management. Not everybody needs a housing subsidy. Uh, some folks have some resources they can use and we can help direct them to a small amount of intervention, a small amount of assistance to get them out of homelessness. Other individuals need a lot of assistance. They need a lot of uh, contact with uh, case managers or uh, they need some financial assistance and those are the things that we want to help connect them to in, in a community. So coordinated entry is just a way to organize the homeless system to better respond to the needs of individuals. Okay, next slide. Um, we'll go ahead and um, go ahead and skip through this here. I, I think, uh, yeah, so we have a, a, a process through the federal uh, agency of um, USICH, United States Interagency on Healthcare, on uh, homeless, um, Homelessness, is a federal makeup of federal agencies that come together, and USICH is sort of tasked with coordinating homelessness response for the nation, pulling all these different federal partners together. Um, USICH, HUD, VA, we all kind of work together and look at how communities are doing based on a set of criteria. Uh, in Ohio, Dayton and Akron were two communities uh, that in prior to COVID, uh, they had submitted effort, submitted uh, 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 application to demonstrate that they had uh, coordinated in such a way that they were able to satisfactorily show they could and veteran homelessness. So these are just two communities that we highlight here. But there have been 83 communities across the country that have gotten that recognition. Um, and I just want to kind of note that here. Um, next slide. Okay. So the VA has a new goal, uh, has, has established a, a new goal because we started to see, we continue to decline in veteran homelessness, but uh, over the last uh, five years or so, before COVID even, uh, we started to see some stalling in the numbers. They weren't going down as much as we would like to see them go down. So starting in 2022, um, the VA put together a effort to try and really put more focus on how we can help move more veterans into permanent housing. Uh, next slide. So we moved into uh, this effort um, uh, starting in 2022 
to identify and move at least 38,000 veterans into permanent housing. We did that in 2022. We're doing this again this year in 2023, but this year we've established three uh, specific goals. And the first goal was we want to house 38,000 veterans. We're on track to do that. We also want to make sure that those veterans that we house don't return to homelessness. So we established additional goal this year uh, to have at least uh, 90, or no more than 5% uh, of those veterans return to homelessness. So 95% of all veterans that we house remain housed through the year. And of the, it, when we do have veterans who have returned to homelessness, so of those 5%, we want to have at least 90% of those veterans re-engage so that we have them on a pathway to return to housing or have rehoused them in the year. So this is a, a, a goal that we've established. The third goal um, is engaging unsheltered veterans. And uh, with COVID, we started to see the numbers of unsheltered continue to uh, start to go back up. So the unsheltered homeless veterans uh, is, a, is a third area where we're looking at engaging, getting them connected to shelter services and then permanent housing. Um, so we have a goal of engaging at least 28,000 unsheltered veterans across the country. A large number of those are on the coast, uh, but we continue to see unsheltered veterans here in Ohio. And uh, uh, I can um, uh, say that we're, um, let's see here. Whoops, I'm sorry. Can, I think I put the wrong button. Can anybody fix that? Uh, okay, so there we go. So we've, um, we have already achieved, um, as a country, this is nationwide, 35,000 veterans out of the 38,000 that we're trying to achieve. We've already housed 35,000. This is through September of this year. Um, we are maintaining uh, a good number of veterans in their housing. It's as uh, indicated by 96% of those that we have housed remain housed uh, so far this year. Uh, and we have had over 100% of uh, our target of the 26,000. So we've had over 31,000 veterans, uh, unsheltered veterans that we've had some engagement with. Uh, so the VA is really pushing this and working with our community partners. And you know, without the community partner, the support of the communities, uh, we could not achieve this. So it's really a, a testament of the uh, support that uh, the VA has had from uh, all the partners out there. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so I think that, that finishes it up. I've got uh, on this slide deck a number of resources uh, that you can go to, I think, if you want to go to the next, uh, next slide after that. Yeah, there we go. So there also is a, uh, you know, if you want to take a picture, you can get the QR code there and get the resources. But there are links in here as well. Um, it goes into more detail about the resources that we have available, how, they, uh, how you can connect uh, to, the, to the VA. Um, as well as all the medical services and healthcare services that we have available for veterans. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, and uh, we have a really uh, innovative um, approach to helping homeless veterans uh, through the court, so I'm gonna introduce Gina and Jill to come and talk about their efforts. Okay. All right. Hi everybody, my name is Gina Kisos, and I am a Veterans Justice Programs social worker with the VA. I actually have what they call a hybrid role, which means that I do the VJO part, working with veterans kind of at the beginnings uh, of the justice system, and then I also do reentry from the prison system and helping veterans get reconnected um, with VA resources when they get out of incarceration. So just to give a little bit of background of how I got to be involved in any of this, um, part of the wonderful services that uh, our national office gives us is that we have a national email chain. And it's really great because you can really learn what other people are doing across the country. And if you're having a struggle with something um, with your job, you can find out what someone's doing in Kansas or California or Oregon or wherever. And an email came across um, that, that chain a little over a year ago saying, hey, there's this homeless court summit that is happening in Washington, DC, and uh, the VJO who sent it is highly involved in the homeless court in San Diego and said, you know, I highly recommend going to this. 
So I sent it to my supervisor, Diane Smith Foster, over here. <laughs> and I said, hey, do you think this is something I can go to? And she said, well, Gina's, what's a homeless court? And I said, I don't know, but if you send me, I will find out and I'll bring it back. And she was able to find the funding and send me. And here we are today. So it's very exciting. Um, so the, the, the Dayton Municipal Court is starting their program. And Jill is going to talk about specifically what Dayton is doing and how Dayton has adapted this model to fit the community. I'm going to share, share just a little bit of information about homeless courts in general and how you can kind of scale it to your community. The goal really is, is to take this information, take the resources we have, and bring it back to your community and see if it's something that would benefit, you know, every community from, you know, large cities to, to small rural counties. Um, so I'm, let's see if I can get this. These are just our objectives. I'm going to click through this. So a little bit of background on homeless courts. Homeless courts were actually kind of birthed out of the first stand down for homeless veterans that happened in San Diego, I think in 1988. I could be correct. <laughs> corrected if that's not correct, um, where a couple of psychologists noticed that there was this need of homeless veterans, and in San Diego, they have obviously a very large homeless population in general and homeless veteran population. And so they had this stand down that many people might be familiar with because we have them locally. And out of that stand down, they asked people, what are services that you need that you're not getting? And one of the highest you know, uh, responses was, we need legal help. We need help with this. And so out of that, they worked with the San Diego Public Defender's Office and the courts to develop a court that actually went to the stand down, met with people who were homeless living on the street at the, at the stand down at the VA and help resolve some of their legal issues that was really be presenting as a barrier to them moving forward with their lives, which is really what the whole program is about. Um, so that's how it all started. This model has been adapted across the country. Um, many cities have, have homeless courts. One of the things when I went to the summit last year and learned about this, they have like a list of all the recognized homeless courts through the American Bar Association. And I didn't see one at all in Ohio. And I was like, we can be the first. <laughs> Let's make this happen. Um, so, but we do not need to be the last. So um, I, I'm excited that maybe you guys can, can help uh, spread this model. Homeless court is, a, is very different than a treatment court in that they kind of call it a recognition court. So a treatment court, many people are probably very familiar with that model. Somebody ha uh, commits a crime, gets arrested for something, they um, are convicted of that, they're sentenced to a treatment court, the treatment court is follow follows them for a period of time, 12, 18, 24 months, however long it takes. They have intensive supervision. They have to participate in whatever the recommended treatments are. It's a wonderful model. And it's a, it's a lot of ask, right? It's, it's very labor intensive. It costs a lot of money. Um, well, I don't know. That, that's probably debatable. But it's, it's a long period of time, right? A homeless court has the opposite model in that we are referring people who are already doing the work that whatever the issues are that, that resulted in their homelessness, whether that be mental health care, substance abuse care, um, you know, just engaging in, in housing services, vocational rehabilitation, those kinds of things. And once the person has committed and shown some effort and engagement in those services, they can be referred to the homeless court um, and the homeless court can say, okay, we recognize all the work that you've been doing and so we're going to forgive some of these old fines, old fees, um, maybe resolve some warrants in certain circumstances um, to help remove those justice barriers from the person moving forward in their housing journey. So each court can kind of decide what kinds of cases they're willing to take or not. Typically, they are really looking at low-level misdemeanors, kind of victimless crimes, right, nonviolent offenses um, that uh, are often associated with someone who might not be housed. And so th those are commonly like trespassing, loitering, maybe some parking tickets, old parking tickets that you couldn't pay. And so uh, then you got a court 
appearance, well, you're not going to pay that, so <laughs> you didn't show up for court. Then you have a failure to appear warrant, and it can kind of just like snowball into something that feels so overwhelming that what do we tend to do is like avoid, right? We just push it over to the side and pretend it doesn't exist until we go to apply for that apartment, right? And then we, our legal uh, history shows up and we can't move forward. So. For the most part, where most uh, homeless courts around the country are really focusing more on those low-level crimes. However, when I was at the summit, one of the courts was starting to um, accept felony-level um, crimes into their homeless court. So it's very adaptable based on what um, your community needs and what your justice partners are, you know, willing to work with. Um, let's see. So. Oftentimes, it's really focusing on forgiving old fines and fees, which can be a big barrier to people. And we're working with people who have limited resources, so they, they don't have the ability to pay those fines and fees. And so it's really just saying, okay, you're working on the things that are, have caused the issues to begin with. Let's get out of the way and forgive those, those, um, those fines and fees. Let's... There is an assurance, and, and, and this is very important in homeless court, of the no custody rule. The idea is that a provider is working with a person, and they are seeing progress and engagement, and a person's really trying, you know, put, putting forth the effort to change their lives. And then the provider will refer to the homeless court, which is usually a public defender's office, and Jill's going to talk about that. And then the public defender's office will do the research to see does this person qualify for homeless court? Is this something that the judge is willing to, you know, agree with? And therefore, when they are invited to homeless court, there's already the expectation that you have been accepted and this is going to be a positive situation, right? It's not going to be something where, where you're going to kind of be tricked into coming to homeless court and then we're going to arrest you and t take you to jail. No one goes to jail from homeless court. That's very, very important because it only takes one time for someone to hear about it and tell their friends and no one will ever come back, right? So it's very important that there's the no custody rule. The American Bar Association provides an amazing support system if you're interested in starting a homeless court. And on our last slide actually has uh, contacts that I was given permission to share with everybody, and they're very, um, you know, wonderful to work with from the American Bar Association. And then um, Matt Wechter, he provides um, technical support. He, he is a public defender out of the San Diego um, uh, Public Defender's Office, and he can provide training. Um, he has this whole like or Excel spreadsheet to help track all the data related to it. He's very technologically like uh, skilled, so he can really help you with all of that. And this is um, something that Matt Wechter from, from San Diego sent me, and it really just shows the timeline and the progression of how a homeless court works. So I know it's, it's small. I can't read it on here. I want to like <laughs> expand it on my page. But like I had said before, the participant selects a provider and starts services. They really kind of recommend that a person be about midway through services, maybe 45 days before a person is referred. And that just shows the courts that this person is engaged. They're doing all the things we're asking them to do. And, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? in order to kind of repay that. They're paying their fines by engaging in treatment, right? And so that's the argument that a provider can make. And then the provider refers them to, um, to the court. The public defender determines eligibility. They work with the, the uh, justice system to make sure that person is accepted. Um, the team might review the progress a person makes, and then the actual court, the docket actually is held, and the person comes up and they say, you've done all of these wonderful things. You know, you've been sober for 90 days, you've got a job at Home Depot or wherever, you're, you're working on a housing plan, all of these things that you're doing, therefore we are going to forgive all of these old fines and fees, or maybe absolve warrants, um, whatever, the situations are and what your court agrees to. So that's kind of the basic outline of how a homeless court works. Jill's going to come and talk about how we have used that information to develop our program in Dayton.
Thank you, Gina, and hi, everybody. Um, like she said, my name's Jill Bucaro. I am a social worker by trade, and I work at the Montgomery County Public Defender's Office, which is in Dayton, Ohio. So we provide criminal defense services for um, individuals who are facing charges in one of our eight misdemeanor courts in our felony court and for juveniles who are facing criminal charges in our juvenile court. So, um, oh, here, let me, let me see if I can do this. There we go. Um, so Gina came to me. Did I go the wrong way? Perfect. Okay. There we go. So Gina came to me. I think it was last fall. Oh, okay. Okay. This is, here we are. So anyways, about a year ago, um, Gina had come to me and she's like, hey, I went to this conference. I'm really interested in starting a homeless court somewhere in Montgomery County or somewhere in the area. What do you think? And like Gina, I had never heard of a homeless court either. So um, she shared that with me and I immediately thought like, wow, what, what a cool idea and something that I think we could really um, do here. So what I should have said before I messed up the slides um, is what I do is I talked about what my office does, which is provide criminal defense services, but I manage um, a team of 16 social workers and paraprofessionals that provide supportive services to individuals who are facing criminal charges in our county. So we provide individual advocacy, but we also keep an eye on what I would call system level advocacy to try to reduce the number of people who are incarcerated in our county, to try to um, kind of reduce the collateral consequences associated with criminal justice involvement and to just reduce recidivism in general for people in Montgomery County. So I said, hey, this is something that is super mission aligned with the work that I do and with what our office does and we would love to talk about putting together a homeless court. So one of the first thing we things that Gina and I brainstormed is like, where do we wanna start, right? And I think when you think about starting a homeless court in your community, you have to think about one, like personal relationships, right? And, and who are some people that you think either in the criminal justice system and in the homeless system that you can get excited about this? And where do you think you can make the biggest impact? So I don't know how your guys' counties are, but like I said, we have eight municipal courts um, in our county. And we thought, well, the city of Dayton, their municipal court makes the most sense, right? Individuals who are experiencing homelessness often are in the urban core in the city of Dayton. That's where they're incurring charges. Also, I think I think um, the judges and the clerk staff there would understand, you know, the importance of this kind of program. So the first thing we did is we reached out to the clerk of Dayton Municipal Courts and said, hey, here's the model, what do you think? And he was super interested. And so we got that first court involved. Um, and then we thought about, too, like, what makes sense for us to do? In our county, we already have mechanisms for people to resolve warrants. So often individuals experiencing homelessness, often individuals who have substance use um, issues, they miss court, right? And then you miss court and you get a warrant. Really in most of our courts in Montgomery County, if you walk in, if you get, you know, call ahead, you can go in and you can resolve those warrants without getting arrested. It didn't really seem like that was a super big need. That was not a gap that wasn't being filled in services in our county. Um, one thing that we did recognize that was really needed was um, trying to get rid of some of these costs court costs and fines and fees associated with criminal justice involvement. So some of the stuff Gina was talking about, old traffic tickets, old court costs, um, fines associated with some different charges. There aren't a lot of mechanisms in our county for forgiving those for people who truly cannot afford to pay them. And the two biggest barriers that come from unpaid costs and fines are drivers like getting your driver's license reinstated, right? So we all know that if you don't pay your court costs and fines, a, a little thing called a warrant block, it's not like a warrant like you're going to get arrested, but it's a block on your license that says you cannot get your driver's license until you pay those costs and fines. Um, we, I see people come through my office often that owe two, three, five thousand dollars in court costs and fines in the area. And we know that that's a number that is never going to be paid, which means that this individual is never going to get their license back. The other major issue that we see with unpaid costs and fines is it prohibits people from sealing criminal records. So if you have not paid your costs and fines associated with your conviction, you don't have what's called a final discharge. And until you have that final discharge, you cannot seal your record. So maybe I went to the BP and I stole a bag of chips seven years ago. I was on probation. I completed probation, but I never paid that like $250 court costs and fine. I can't go seal that theft off my record until that fine is paid. Um, and we know that some major barriers for individuals experiencing homelessness, to bring it all back, is that um, 
you know, in, in the city of Dayton, it is hard to maintain a job and support a family if you don't have your driver's license. Our public transportation system, not great, not super accessible. And um, individuals are getting denied from apartment complexes, both like subsidized housing programs and just regular apartments because of their legal history, because they don't have the ability to seal their criminal convictions. So I say all that to say, we sat down with our providers. We thought like, man, what are some really big barriers that people are experiencing when they're trying to get housed? We sat down with the court and said, what are some gaps? Like, what are you guys willing to do? And we landed on, let's use this court model um, to forgive costs and fines post disposition. So after cases are all the way over. So I don't know, Gina, we had a million trillion Zoom meetings um, with a bunch of different people. And we ultimately kind of got everybody on board. We presented it to the judges at Dayton Municipal Court. And after a couple, well, about a year of work, they decided, um, yep, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do it. So starting in 2024, we are going to have a quarterly Fresh Start Docket, that's what it's called. Um, our first one will be January 18th, and um, our homeless providers are going to refer individuals, just how Gina explained, to the Public Defender's Office. We will review their charges for eligibility and then submit them to the court to hopefully get them on our dockets. So um, Gina and I, with some technical assistance um, from the, some of the supports that we'll put up here at the end, we developed the referral form, we developed a process. I mean, you guys understand things with the courts often do not move very quickly. So we've given ourselves, you know, kind of like a six, eight week ramp up to each court to be able to collect um, the referrals, to assess the individuals for eligibility, to alert the court, to file the proper filings, and to make sure everybody is able to appear for the actual docket day. I do want to talk a little bit about um, inclusionary and exclusionary criteria, because that's something that, that we engage in a lot of discussion about. So individuals, um, to be considered for the homeless court, they have to be involved with one of our front door providers. So we're kind of going back to that idea of coordinated entry um, from the, the previous speaker. That So individuals who are staying in our shelters, who are working with the veterans, um, with the VA outreach program, um, or who are staying on the streets and working with the street outreach provider are eligible for the homeless court. They do have to be working with that provider for between 30 and 60 days in order to qualify. And our referral form captures some information that we think will be um, you know, interesting and compelling to the court. Did the person get their forms of ID? Have they signed up for benefits? Are they on housing lists? Are they searching for employment? Do they have employment? Are they linked with a mental health provider? Something like that. Um, and then they will come to the public defender's office and will look at their legal history. We are not going to forgive costs and fines associated with certain charges, um, and those charges are OVIs, domestic violences, and any charges that are sexual in nature um, and child endangerment. So just because a person has one of those charges does not mean that they are not allowed to be in the program, just the costs and fines associated with those charges will not be forgiven by the court. So um, they will be screened, we will sit down with the prosecutor, we will sit down with the judge, we will sit down with the clerk's office, and we'll review every single application, determine who is eligible and who is not. The other thing I forgot to mention is that anybody who has any open cases or who is currently on probation or parole will also not be eligible. This is going to be for people whose criminal justice involvement for the time being is completely concluded. Um, and so that's kind of what our criteria look like or looks like we are planning to expand to some of those other municipal courts that I noted my like personal goal is let's get the first one in Dayton under our belt I'm hoping to invite a couple judges from other municipalities to observe the second one and then maybe we can even start to incorporate them um, in quarters three and four of next year so this is what our little referral form looks like. So this is what the um, referring agencies will fill out with the demographic information for the individual. Kind of this stuff at the bottom is what I talked about. What are some of the, what's some of the progress this person is making? What treatment are they involved in? Um, you know, what benefits have they applied for? Tell us a little bit about their family. Again, things that are gonna be interesting um, you know, and compelling for the court. So I think that's pretty much it. This final slide, like Gina said, um, has mine and Gina's information. 
and then also has Matt, Matt and Kelly, who are some of the people that helped us when we were kind of trying to, to nail down some of the details of our particular court. So there, I'll leave it there. And I think that's all we got. Unless anybody has any questions or any. I don't know if we're doing questions, so maybe not. <laughs> but I think that's all we got. Yeah, go. I, can, I, can I do questions? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, let me do this. When it comes to the providers, how did you select them? That's a great question. So we started just with, we call them our front door providers um, within our coordinated entry system. So that includes um, the three homeless shelters, the VA outreach, homeless outreach program, and then our street outreach provider. Um, our hope is to expand it to some of our other homeless providers that do like permanent supportive housing or transitional housing, potentially look at some of our treatment providers for individuals who have landed in residential treatment or sober living. We wanted to keep the numbers small so it didn't feel overwhelming to the court. So the court wasn't like, oh my gosh, 30 different providers are gonna be able to refer people, you know, so-and-so is gonna be referring their cousin and you know, except, so we tried to keep it very small. So we just did front door homeless providers. All right. Well, thank you guys. Good afternoon. So my name is Maya Jenkins. Um, I am the prison reentry social worker based out of Cleveland for the VA. Um, I've been doing prison reentry since 2011. I'm looking at Jim, I think, around 2011. Um, so I've been around a little bit of time. I was tasked today to talk about our VRSS system. So VRSS, it stands for the Veterans Reentry Search Service. We've talked a little bit about today, or today, about our veterans justice programming and the great work we do in the court dockets and the great work we do in the prison system. And you know, our goal is to help our veterans re-enter society, get the treatment they need. But it comes down to the question of how do we know where they are? How do we know who they are? So I can tell you back in 2011 when I started this job, we didn't have VRSS. So what did we do? Right? So we walk into the prison system and we're like, hey, we're here to help you. We got some hands raised, right? Hey, I'm a veteran. I can do that. Um, we would work with our prison systems back then to say, hey, can you develop, can you put something on your intake form to ask the question, do you have any military service? Well, they used to ask, of course, are you a veteran? Right? And then we had to change that. Um, do you have any military service? So that was all self-report. You can imagine the issues and problems um, that came with that. So that's a little bit of a background of why the VA finally said, hey, we need to develop some kind of a system to actually identify who these folks are, who needs the help, so we can kind of coordinate our efforts. I'll tell you, there's a lot of information on these slides. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but I wanted you all to have it. So if you say, you know, you go back and you say, hey, I wanna do a little more research on VRSS, you'll be able to access it. Um, let's see, so I pretty much, what is VRSS? So it's a web-based, it's a free web-based tool that our correctional systems, our courts, upload data into. And then magic happens with the computer systems and it matches with our military history information and all of a sudden we get a report. That's what it boils down to. Um, we kind of already talked about that. So a little bit about how this helps, because like I said, I did a lot of prison reentry before we had VRSS, and I've done a lot of prison reentry after we've been able to implement VRSS here in Ohio. Um, all of our work and effort now is targeted. I know where all my veterans are and what prison they are, actually in what cell location they are within that prison before I even walk in the door. So I can walk in the door already knowing, and I do the pre-work to verify VA eligibility. Um, 
So it allows us to target our efforts a lot better, to walk in and actually have the forms, have the enrollment paperwork, have whatever information they need instead of walking in blind. Uh, talking with someone who a lot of times, unfortunately, was not even a veteran. So like I said, you can go back and read um, some of the more detailed information. So what gets uploaded, let me get to that, because that's kind of interesting. Sorry, guys. OK, so this is what the information that our correctional systems upload into VRSS. So they upload it, magic happens, like I said, and then all of a sudden we can go in as users, we can go into VRSS, download those reports. We get a lot of more detailed information than what the court systems get back. Um, sometimes they get a little angry about that, but this is all protected veteran health, inf or health information, but protected veteran information, which is why we as HCRV VJOs get a lot more information back than what the prison or court system is left with. But they do get information on how many veterans are in their system. It's just not the specific information that we get. There we go. That's kind of what I talked about. So we get the information on number of days served. Um, so then we can go in and verify that data like I already talked about. So we can go in and know, hey, this person's eligible for VA. What I should back up. What VRSS does not tell us is VA eligibility. That's where our own knowledge has to come into play. Uh, but it gives us the information to figure out what that is. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of idea um, on what the report looks like that we got back, that, or that we as VJP staff can look at. Um, obviously, I took off all the identifying information. Usually, all those first columns are filled in. Um, but we get last name, gender, date of birth, social, all of that. Um, this is a report that I pulled up for Toledo Correctional, which, as we've talked about, doesn't have that many veterans at Toledo. Um, but just to give you an idea, that's what we see. And then we have release date, or when they're going to see the parole board. So what makes it nice for us is I can go in, uh, most of my lists are much, much larger than this one, but I can go in and organize my spreadsheet by their release date. So then I can say, okay, here's the, the folks I need to target my efforts toward. One of the questions I get asked sometimes is how often do our correctional systems have to upload these files? And there is no frequency that's required. So it really just depends on what your needs are. Um, I know our prison system uploads it. Our goal is once a week. Um, sometimes that doesn't always happen. Um, now, obviously, in the jail system, those to really be effective have to be uploaded a lot more frequently. Um, prison system, my guys aren't going anywhere, and ladies aren't going anywhere sometimes for a long time. Um, so I also put on here the quick user guide. Um, I don't expect anyone to read all those letters on this page right now, but if you say, hey, this is something that's kind of interesting, um, we at VA have tried to make it as easy as possible for our court systems, prison systems, uh, to implement this. So we have developed down to the quick user guide, questions, we will walk you through the process. So I think I'm going to skip forward because we kind of talked about all this. Um, those are just the sequential intercept model and VRSS. We like to use VRSS along the whole process of the model, right? And then we're going to end just with a short little video on VRSS um, just to kind of give you an idea of why we need it, why we use it, why it's a great thing. Um, does anyone have any questions? before we do that? No, I know VRSS isn't all that exciting. Jeremy? He can talk loudly. 
My only question is, is uh, you said correctional facilities have access to this. Uh, is state contracted halfway houses included in that? To my knowledge, we do not have any halfway houses that are using VRSS. No. But they could, right? Right? <laughs> no, we would love that. Because um, like I said, it truly, truly helps us um, know who we need to work with. Because, you know, like I referenced before, in the beginning, you know, back in the old days when I started the job, sometimes we would, I would waste 10, 20, 30 minutes talking with someone at a prison. And then I get back and realize they fed me a whole line of information that wasn't quite true. Um, so, you know, it, it can waste a lot of time too. So. And we also know that a lot of our veterans within the prison system, what we found out was they underreport. They don't report that they're a veteran for a variety of reasons. Um, they're embarrassed. They feel like their military status should have kept them out of the system. Um, there's confusion about the word veteran within the prison system. You know, a lot of guys I met with said, so, well, I never, I never thought I was a veteran, so anytime anyone asked me, I would say no. I'm like, well, you are, and we can get you hooked up for services and benefits. Um, so yeah, it helps with a whole bunch of things. Every day in the field of criminal justice, you have the power to change lives. What if I told you there is a tool that can make your job easier? while allowing you to change the lives of veterans. The Veterans Reentry Search Service, or VRSS, is an easy to use VA supported tool that can strengthen partnerships between your facility and VA. It alerts VA staff to veterans in your population so they can provide them with important services that assist with their reentry. As a veteran who has worked in the criminal justice system for 22 years, I have had the opportunity to use the Veterans Reentry Service and want to recommend it to all of my colleagues. It's extremely easy to use, and I have personally witnessed the good it can do for veterans. No matter if you're serving in a correctional setting or the court system, VRSS is a free encrypted web-based portal that requires no downloads or special training. You simply drop a single file with your population's information into VRSS and it does the rest, supplying you with all the information you need to find veterans and help them connect with services that will help them plan for their reentry. At its core, VRSS is designed to make your job easier by giving you a better understanding of who you are working with and by allowing VA to target its outreach to veterans in your population and help your veterans access needed services make a difference in a veteran's life by using VRSS and connecting them with VA. Visit vrss.va.gov to help a veteran today. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope that leaves everyone uh, inspired to go back and learn more about VRSS if it's not already in use. Uh, in your jurisdiction. That is um, something that we are uh, trying to get um, uh, operating in as many of our partners, uh, institutions, and systems as we possibly can because, as Maya said, if we don't know uh, who the veterans are and where they are, uh, we're not able to reach them uh, with the services that we can help them connect to. Um, so I'm Sean Clark. I'm the, the National Director of the Veterans Justice Programs. We are a part of the homeless programs within the VA Health Administration, uh, within the Department of Veterans Affairs, along with the Veterans Benefits Administration and the National Cemetery Administration. Um, that's a little bit of tedious um, uh, structural mapping uh, to start off uh, remarks with, but I always like to situate us within what's a very big and complex organization. We're part of the healthcare system and we're part of the homeless programs and we're focused on criminal justice. Um, that's the basics, I think, of what you need to know and, and why we're here. Um, the importance of intervening as early as possible, um, and um, let me see if I can manage to make this. There we go. Um, I, I'm under no illusion. Uh, you all heard from Jack Charlier this morning. Um, I'm under no illusion that I can teach you anything about deflection as a concept or a model that, that, uh, that you wouldn't have learned better from Jack. 
Um, so I'm not going to belabor uh, this content here at the beginning of the slides, um, which is pretty introductory. This is the, we're, and so you know, we're drawing on some materials here that we're using in a series of national trainings for VA staff um, across our system um, to try and get uh, VA uh, across the board uh, at every facility uh, of ours uh, across our healthcare system uh, able to partner effectively uh, with deflection initiatives as they're popping up across Ohio and throughout the United States. We want to make sure that we're uh, well positioned to follow this trend um, and to help make sure that it includes a veteran focus and that it includes uh, pathways to accessing VA resources in every community that adopts um, this new approach. Um, but so you know, this is the, the origin of uh, some of the material that I will move pretty quickly through here. Uh, in the beginning. Um, what motivates us to do this work? As I mentioned, uh, we have just uh, pre-existing institutional motivations. It's the nature of our mission. Um, but I want to spend just a moment and talk about the stakes uh, for this population and, and, and why we're doing this work. So as we've heard a couple of times, incarceration as an adult male uh, in particular is the most powerful predictor of homelessness that there is. Um, this is an incredibly tight nexus. It's a two-way street as well. Um, but the population that we're serving, um, just the, the nature of the way that these factors work together, that's why um, the VA's outreach efforts uh, targeting the criminal justice system are located within the homeless programs. Um, and that's where many of the uh, referral pathways uh, follow through um, after we make this initial outreach contact with justice-involved veterans. In many cases, uh, these veterans are, are entering uh, VA homeless programs. Uh, after their initial contact uh, with our staff in criminal justice settings. Um, as Jim mentioned and, and, and shared some really uh, promising uh, uh, updated data on, um, this has been the focus of a um, uh, more than 30 years of, as a national program, program excuse me, uh, in the department, but in particular over the last 10 years or so um, with VA's commitment to ending veteran homelessness um, has really seen uh, an increased commitment of resources um, and, it, and an urgency in the messaging and the call to partnership um, going out from our department and in communities across the country um, that are, I, I think, really speak to um, a, a, a motivation uh, to take a more, uh, a more focused and, and, again, a more urgent uh, approach uh, to the situation, to serving uh, veterans who are homeless or at risk um, and, 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 and ending uh, that status for them as quickly as they can. We've seen great progress, uh, as Jim detailed, um, but there's a lot more work to do. Um, because, as he said, uh, a veteran becomes homeless uh, uh, every day um, across the system. Um, speaking of motivation, there could be no more powerful motivation um, for, for, for calling an agency and, and community partnerships to action uh, than preventing suicide. And what we know about justice involvement and the risk for suicide that it brings with it, um, I, I think, you know, couldn't be starker. And you see the statistic here on the slide that uh, the veterans who we see in our programs, uh, veterans justice programs, um, are three times more likely to have attempted suicide uh, than veterans seen in VA who are not criminally justice involved. So um, I, I, th I think I used the word stakes earlier. They couldn't be higher. We're working with a very high risk and high need population uh, in this outreach work that we're doing um, and in the, um, uh, in the work that we're partnering uh, with uh, uh, community agencies uh, to help get ensure that these veterans are identified and they can access our services and other community services at the earliest possible point. So let me see. Um, the I've high need. I think I've, I've covered this. And the um, so and also speaking of stakes and thinking specifically about deflection and the importance of intervening early, um, there are real concrete and immediate consequences um, that happen that follow when a veteran uh, enters the criminal justice system, and some of them are specific to the Department of Veterans Affairs and the services that we provide. Um, so. I always like to start out uh, by mentioning what we can do for veterans who are criminally justice involved. We serve them through outreach. Um, veterans who are justice involved in any other way than being incarcerated, um, their eligibility status for VA services is unchanged. Um, but what happens when a veteran's incarcerated um, is this regulation uh, is, is activated. And a veteran's eligibility for VA health care um, is suspended until the veteran is released from incarceration. Um, this is not specific to prisons or jails. It also includes veterans who are in other settings uh, that are custodial, uh, where the, 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 the custodial agency has a duty to provide care. State hospitals uh, are the classic example there, but it absolutely affects veterans in prison and jail settings uh, as well. So as soon as a veteran uh, goes behind bars, they lose access to VA health care until they come back out. 
Um, there's profound implications for continuity of care, veterans who are receiving services from VA uh, potentially. Um, again, those are disrupted. Any transition uh, in the provision of care, especially for folks who may be at heightened risk uh, for suicide, other negative outcomes, um, that's only aggravated uh, by these transitions. And oftentimes, uh, the services that are available uh, in incarcerated settings aren't the exact equivalent um, of what veterans would be receiving on the outside, including um, simple differences like having a different formulary. Uh, different drugs to treat the same conditions, these little things uh, that can cause disruption and, uh, and, and compromise uh, veterans' health. Um, so real and immediate consequences from incarceration, best avoided when we can, uh, which of course is the spirit of deflection uh, and why we're so excited to be, uh, to be a part of that story as it's unfolding across the system. Um, so, in, in, in joining uh, this trend uh, toward looking earlier, intervening earlier, um, we're continuing a trajectory that NVA has really defined uh, the justice program since they first got started. Um, we, I, I think we've heard several variations on the theme throughout the day of, you know, looking earlier, moving the focus back in time. Um, and that's been the growth of our, of our uh, justice programs in VA. We started out uh, with uh, the program that, that Maya mentioned and that others have mentioned, Healthcare for Reentry Veterans. That was the first national uh, VA program focused on veterans who were justice involved. And it's looking at veterans coming out of state and federal prison, making sure they're able to link up um, with VA services at the earliest possible point when they're coming back out. And again, their eligibility for VA healthcare is reactivated uh, for those who were, who were eligible and just temporarily unable to, to get that care while they were inside. Um, the natural next question is why are you waiting until someone has a felony conviction and is serving 10 plus years, whatever the case may be, uh, to intervene? Why don't you look earlier on in the criminal justice system? That's when we started the Veterans Justice Outreach Program, uh, which focuses um, on partnerships in local jails, uh, with local law enforcement, and of course with veterans treatment courts, uh, which is the, which those are the partnerships that we're best known for to the extent that the program is known. Uh, across the system. Veterans treatment courts have been deservedly celebrated, gotten a lot of attention, and have grown very quickly, and we're proud um, uh, to be associated with them. But we do more than that uh, in veterans justice outreach, so jail outreach and these partnerships with local law enforcement um, as well. Um, now, um, we are um, recognizing, uh, and I think the country is recognizing, um, that there's an opportunity to do uh, a tremendous amount of good before any of that happens, before uh, veterans uh, enter the criminal justice system at all. And so, looking for opportunities for them to bounce off the system or to put a goalie in front of the system, choose your metaphor, um, but to avoid the potential for any of those collateral consequences to occur in the first place. Um, so, um, this is for us a natural progression, a natural part of the evolution of our programs, um, and we want to make sure that we're, again, that we're partnering effectively uh, with the community uh, uh, organizations and, and, and departments uh, that are making these deflection initiatives uh, happen, that are getting this concept off the ground. I like to think that um, the deflection model is where the Veterans Treatment Court model was about 10 years ago. Um, some great, promising examples. Um, but still, you know, not uh, active uh, in most communities um, and a lot of room to grow. Um, so just in the same way that uh, as we were starting the Veterans Justice Outreach Program and building these partnerships that led to the development of Veterans Treatment Courts and continue to lead to the development of new ones, that work is going to continue. We're not pulling back or out of any of these other criminal justice settings. We're going to continue to do the prison outreach. The work that we do in veterans treatment courts, we're just broadening our focus um, and looking earlier in time and making sure that there's an effective pathway into our services um, from every step for veterans who are, are at um, every step along the way, including uh, Intercept Zero and those folks who haven't yet to enter uh, the criminal justice system in the first place. So. Uh, what we can do, these are uh, just a graphic depiction of our partners um, in these deflection initiatives and where this work is happening, where it's being led, uh, primarily law enforcement driven, but as Jack said, um, and uh, they are um, always um, uh, conscious, I think, of giving credit where it's due. It's very important. Just the tremendous diversity of the way that these deflection initiatives um, are taking shape. Um, they're not all law enforcement driven. Um, we see a lot of involvement from other first responder agencies, community treatment providers. Um, there are as many ways to do this work um, as there are communities that have adopted it. Another parallel, I think, with veterans treatment courts that are uh, at this point uh, in, their, in their history still very diverse as well. They're united by a concept um, as opposed to, you know, really the operational details that look very different. 
this is, I think, for the reference books for you all. You'll have access to these slides. I'm sure you can't read these. Um, this is a bit more detail, and again, this is, I would say, stolen, but we did cite, of course, um, a, a task um, and, and Jack's organization um, in, in borrowing uh, this. This is another uh, uh, bit of uh, information that we use in the trainings that we're doing across our system right now um, to help demonstrate um, you know, some of the common themes, but also the breadth. Um, of these deflection initiatives. We want to make sure that the, the VA staff who are going to be partnering uh, with these deflection uh, projects understand that what you're looking at will, may look very different from what your colleague is looking at one county over. Um, and that's okay. This is um, in, in, in the same way uh, that we talk about the nature of our work at other st uh, intercepts in the criminal justice system. Um, what we're trying to accomplish is a big picture task as opposed to imposing uh, you know, some rigid specific procedure on our community partners. We have no interest in doing that um, and it's just structurally inappropriate for VA to be telling uh, criminal justice agencies how to do criminal justice work. We're here to help, we're here to bring resources to the table um, and to help ensure again that there are these effective pathways into services uh, for veterans out of these criminal justice settings. But again, Good information uh, uh, statistically on, on what's known about uh, the growth of deflection initiatives so far and what they look like, but still very, mu very fluid, very much taking shape uh, as we speak. And here are some more good examples of that. I think a couple of really encouraging points um, and some areas of convergence with VA are the breadth of um, uh, uh, peer support uh, services being involved in these deflection initiatives. There's a recognition from the outset of this model that that's critical. Um, uh, in providing a, you know, a full range of support and, and, uh, for veterans uh, at the outset who are at this very early um, zero intercept level, um, but recognizing the value of peer-to-peer -peer interactions and helping coach veterans into care, potentially providing that kind of non-clinical peer-to-peer uh, -peer support that can be so powerful in addition to or in some cases instead of a clinical intervention. Um, we're expanding our program in that direction as well. Um, we now fund about 50 uh, peer specialists who are working specifically with justice-involved veterans uh, across the VA healthcare system, and we're going to continue to grow that workforce uh, as well. So supplementing uh, the work that um, our, our great VJO and HCRV specialists uh, are doing with justice-specific peer services in the VA system as well. We're very excited about that. Let's see. So what can VA bring to the table in these partnerships? We've heard quite a bit about uh, VA treatment services, the other uh, resources that are available in our medical centers, our outpatient clinics, the vet centers, um, the, um, and, and our, our, our other and smaller facilities as well. Um, so I, I, I mentioned this training initiative that we are uh, still in the midst of. We're going to have it wrapped up by January. We will have delivered this training uh, to uh, team members from every uh, VA medical center in our system uh, by January uh, of 2024. Um, who that consists of is a VJO specialist from every VA, um, a mental health provider from every VA, and a VA police officer um, from every VA. And so that this, the composition of those teams is very intentional. Um, we want to make sure that there is this interdisciplinary base of knowledge um, at every one of our systems um, and that community partners um, regardless of um, uh, the nature of the agency that they're representing, have a peer to talk to. Um, and so that we don't create a barrier um, to VA participating in a deflection initiative because we have the wrong type of staff person trained to have that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and to connect on that level. So recognizing the great majority uh, of these initiatives that are, are centered in uh, law enforcement agencies, oftentimes led by them, our partners in VA police um, have been uh, at the table from the beginning and we make sure that we've got a VA police officer from every VA um, uh, trained um, uh, in these, uh, the basics of deflection uh, initiatives and the different varieties um, that these uh, deflection initiatives, uh, the uh, call them six flavors or I think pathways uh, is the term that Jack and his colleagues use. We want them to be understand what they're looking at. When they hear an initiative described, they say, oh, okay, I understand this is one of, uh, this falls into that bucket, um, that particular type of deflection initiative. The details will vary, but we just want to make sure that uh, folks know what they're hearing about and can start thinking about how VA uh, services can, can best plug in uh, and contribute there. Um, the, let me see. VA police, of course, that linkage, and just operationally, in addition to the planning um, and uh, having that peer-to-peer -peer contact, 
um, any kind of partnership that is going to involve um, a community law enforcement provider bringing a veteran to a VA facility, that relationship between community law enforcement and VA police is critical. Um, if we have outside law enforcement coming onto a VA campus, that needs to be coordinated and it needs to happen through VA police. So making sure that we're all on the same page um, and you don't have, say, emergency department staff making promises without VA police partners knowing about it, that just leads to chaos and, um, you know, can under undermine uh, one of these partnerships before they even get off the ground. Um, so the treatment services, uh, the police uh, liaison uh, element, um, and again, I think some, a lot of these um, uh, possible contributions are, are true of the work that our VGO and HCRV specialists do, but it's true of our system as a whole, and again, bringing that interdisciplinary perspective. The point of all of this, and I think if you take nothing else from um, you know, what VA is looking to do in the deflection world, uh, we want to make sure that um, veterans are a focus of these deflection uh, initiatives, that there's a way to identify them, um, a way to get them connected to VA care and other veteran-focused uh, uh, resources that are available in the community outside VA. Um, and that those VA resources in our system um, are a part of the toolkit um, that um, when this planning work is happening, uh, part of that uh, that needs to happen at the outset is mapping out what do we have available? What's, the, what's on the back end of this? We, we're doing the identification work. We want to deflect them uh, out of criminal justice involvement. What are we deflecting them to? Um, we want to make sure that in addition to the community resources that are, you know, that are a part of these planning efforts already, make sure VA is a part of the, a, a, a part of the mix as well um, and that that's uh, uh, informing the planning uh, as, as early as possible, uh, ideally at the very outset of it. So again, this is another slide from uh, the training that we're conducting across the system. I share this not to tell you anything in particular about these uh, uh, deflection an initiatives, but just to, uh, to note the inclusion of Cincinnati. Um, this is uh, one um, uh, model that we are um, holding up um, across our system. Um, it's gotten national recognition, as you all have heard, and I'm sure this is Ohio, you all know this, uh, the award that they won from the Department of Justice. The exciting thing, um, um, uh, this because Cincinnati had been on our radar for a while, but the exciting thing about the series of trainings that we're doing is finding out about all that's going on that hadn't, hadn't risen to our attention. Um, at the outset of it. And so uh, we're going to hear more about that in just a little while. Um, but um, I, we've heard uh, this morning about Ohio being a leader um, in the development of veteran specific criminal justice interventions. That is as true in deflection as it is uh, in veterans treatment courts and elsewhere. Um, so uh, the training that we did um, in Cincinnati just a couple of months ago was really eye opening for us for that reason because we got to hear about the great work um, that's going on in Columbus and that we'll hear a bit about and that's going on. Um, uh, in other cities across Ohio. So it's an exciting time uh, for deflection and specifically an exciting time uh, for deflection work in Ohio and we're eager to be a part of it. Uh, so I think um, the, it's bringing me close to the end, reference material for more information about these different um, uh, uh, models that have been developed and some of the attention that they've received. Um, and some cool examples, I think, of concrete resources that have come out of this joint planning work um, based on feedback um, uh, from law enforcement partners about what would be most helpful um, and kind of a, a platform uh, for shared operations. This led to the development of QR codes. Um, and this is the one for Cincinnati that provides basic information. Again, this was designed with, uh, with uh, community law enforcement input. What's going to be helpful to you to pull up in the moment? Um, when you're, you're having that encounter, um, you're looking for resources, you know, what you don't need is a list of 150 links to click on, something like that, something that's quickly legible, that's easy, it's got phone numbers that work, that go to, a, you know, that go, you know you're going to get a response, uh, because we know uh, the first time uh, you're given a number that doesn't get picked up, or somebody says, I don't know what you're talking about, that kills the credibility uh, of VA as a partner um, uh, in these initiatives. So we're, we're very attuned to that, um, and we're going to continue to work with our facilities as they engage with these deflection initiatives uh, to make sure that stays at the forefront. Uh, we've got to ensure that anything that we commit to, we're actually able to deliver on, and not just, oh, it would be nice to do this, um, but, but by the time we commit to something that we're, we're sure that we're able to deliver on it, and to deliver on it at 3 o'clock in the morning as well as at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, as the case may be. Now, not all of our facilities are the same, not all of them have emergency departments, um, and so what we're going to be able to commit to uh, is going to vary from place to place. Um, but again, just making sure that our, our actions are able to follow through on our words in these partnerships uh, to make them sustainable. Uh, so that's the Cincinnati QR code. We've got... 
a dead clicker, I think, or a malfunctioning user. Um, oh, here we go. Another, uh, another use uh, for these QR code uh, resources, posters uh, that can be put up. So there, we'll see a lot more, the exciting thing, we'll see a lot more great examples of this that we haven't yet, um, but that's just a couple of concrete um, uh, examples for, uh, for where this work can go and, and, and turn into immediately usable uh, resources that are gonna help veterans get connected to care in the moment. And importantly, get our law enforcement partners back out there, you know, make sure that these are effective efficient transactions for them, and they're not spending half of the shift waiting around uh, in a VA emergency department. Okay, uh, looks like that's it. So enough from me. Um, I, I, if you take, again, nothing from what I've said, it's that VA is an eager partner um, uh, in these deflection initiatives, um, and uh, we're going to remain so. We think this is the future uh, of our justice outreach work, is getting ahead of the justice piece entirely, getting ahead of that uh, uh, justice involvement in the first place. Um, but um, taking advantage of the fact that we are in Ohio and there's so much exciting work going on um, here, I am going to stop talking at you right now um, and cede the floor to my colleagues um, to hear more about uh, what this is turning into uh, in practice across the state. So thank you all very much. Uh, good afternoon. If I can have the panel come up, and um, we're going to put chairs up on the stage here. So, why we're doing that? Um, okay, everyone. Um, my name is Teresa Sickman, and you heard my name referenced earlier. I work as the uh, Deputy Network Homeless Coordinator for Vision 10. So, I work with Jim Canelli. Um, and VJO, VJP work is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so, those I recognize from the audience. I started in VJO back in 2011, so I recognize Judge Loxley out there from working with him quite a while ago. So I am definitely glad to be back to these efforts. Um, so, and I've definitely attended several of these in the past when I did that work. Okay, so what we'll start with first is I'll just have each of the panel members um, if, introduce themselves and what their current role at the VA is. Uh, I am Paige Lehman. I'm a Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist at the Dayton VA. I've been doing this position since about 2015 when actually Teresa, who used to be a VJO, uh, trained me. So uh, I learned from the best over here. So yeah, hopefully that's a good thing. Hi everyone, my name is Calandria Jewett and I'm a social worker, or a Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinator in Dayton, but primarily assigned to um, Montgomery County. Hello, I'm Heather Robinson. I'm a psychologist at the Columbus VA and I'm the director of our Trauma Recovery Division. Hi, I'm William Robinson. I'm the Chief of Police at the Columbus VA and I'm also an Army and Air Force veteran. Not, for, not against the Army, but I got smart and went to the Air Force after I took a little break. I call it the Chair Force, you know luxury side. I'm Christy Wood. I'm a Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinator and actually in a hybrid role connected to the Ann Arbor Healthcare System and the Toledo Outpatient Clinic. So my VJO efforts are in Ohio while my reentry efforts are in Southeast Michigan. Okay, so next thing I will ask the panel to do is kind of go through and give um, some information on their deflection efforts thus far. I, I will start, uh, but I'll probably hand over to uh, Calandria here in a little bit. Uh, first and foremost, like the, the, the primary person on our team who's actually spearheading all of this uh, deflection is actually Sarah, who's probably watching right now. And I really wish she was here because uh, she has way more information than, than either me or uh, Calandria will have. But we can certainly say uh, when it comes to deflection uh, as it pertains to, to our job, which I'm not going to rehash all all the things that we just kind of spoke about. Uh, to be honest with you, we're, we're kind of on board with if, uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and also like no, no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we immediately reached out to our Cincinnati counterparts uh, who 
luckily I knew them fairly well because I had been at the Cincinnati VA prior to coming to to, to Dayton uh, and basically sat down with Ron Michelson and uh, and uh, Bethany Hamilton Clary and, and, and various other members of, of the team and they had a great model going on like I said it, you've seen the 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 little card up there, uh, they really simplified and streamlined the process where they actually just hand out the cards to uh, local law enforcement. Uh, of course, after they, you know, uh, formed relationships with local law enforcement and then hand out the card, it's got a simple QR code, which we're actually working on that now. Sarah is, I think we're, I think the QR code is done. I'm not sure where it's at right now, but, uh, but w more to come on that. So you basically just uh, hand the card out to local law enforcement. Uh, when they engage a veteran uh, at Intercept Zero, as everyone here should be aware of that by now, uh, prior to crisis and certainly prior to incarceration or, or during crisis potentially, but before incarceration or any kind of, uh, uh, you know, hard judicial uh, insertion, they will actually hand in the card, they will scan the QR code, and the QR code will immediately bring up, uh, I know, my information, Calandria, Gina, and Sarah, as well as uh, various specialty clinics attached to the Dayton VA, you know, PTSD, substance abuse, uh, uh, all of our uh, residential treatment programs, things of that nature, and it has contact information for all of them. It's not overwhelming, uh, nor should it be. Uh, uh, because obviously when, when a, uh, we understand when a police officer is kind of in the moment, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be overwhelmed and drink from a fire hydrant in there, right? You want to be able to scan a QR code, get some quick uh, input, uh, and lead them in the right direction. And what I, even, what I tell people, what we haven't handed the cards out yet because they're under development, is worst case scenario, if you still can't process all the information that comes up, uh, the, the various specialty clinics, all this other information, uh, always reach out to a VJO. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I give my business card to all kinds of people. I get calls from, from pretty much people from all walks of life. Uh, they just hear justice and veteran, and they immediately think that I'm gonna, uh, I, can, I can assist them. Most of the times I can, and if I can't directly, I can certainly lead them in the right direction. Uh, but so as, as it pertains to, to deflection, from, from my standpoint, that's, that's kind of what we're doing at the Dayton VA. Uh, well, that's, I don't know if that's long deflection per se, but, and I'm also in the process of, I, I recently reached out to the, uh, I, I don't know what his title is, Barry Riley's at Deputy Chief, or Chief, De I swapped it, Chief Deputy of the Warren County uh, uh, Sheriff's Department. So I'm, I'm also trying to get a veterans pod, because uh, Warren County is, 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 it's kind of my footprint. Uh, there's four of us, and, and we cover multiple counties, but I live the furthest south of all the other VJOs, so I tend to spend a lot of time in Warren County, uh, northern Butler County, where Middletown, we have a veterans treatment court there as well, and I will venture up, uh, but usually anything north of me, I start venturing into Montgomery County, which is Calandria's backyard, and uh, we try not to cook in other people's kitchen and, unless she wants me to, so if I ever get somebody from... Uh, uh, Montgomery County, uh, I will certainly send them their way. So, but the good thing about a veterans pod, you can simply just walk in, get full access to all the veterans on the pod, sit down, uh, get, get their stories, figure out what they're doing, and, uh, and, and go on from there. So uh, it, it's a work in progress. So. Sure, I'll take over and talk a little bit about um, Montgomery County. So uh, one thing that I think is really cool that we do in Montgomery County is something called the MR MCRT Roundtable. It's Montgomery County Roundtable. We call it the MCRT. Um, and this is an opportunity to bring together community providers in all of Dayton. So we have uh, law enforcement, our local hospitals, mental health, homeless providers, and we all come to the table and talk about um, individuals who are kind of high utilizer of like emergency rooms and maybe law enforcement are interacting with them quite a bit. These aren't necessarily people that have uh, legal charges, um, but that's why I think it's really important for deflection because the emphasis is on that prevention piece, right? So let's engage with these people early when we're starting to see that um, maybe they could benefit from enhanced treatment in our communities and um, bring together all of those providers to figure out what roles um, you know, we all play in serving that individual and how to help them in the best way possible to prevent them from eventually um, possibly having legal charges. So I think that that's a really neat uh, deflection 
effort that we have going on in Montgomery County. Um, Paige, you talked a lot about uh, the QR codes, and although that is still in the works, we really look forward to being able to pass those out at our CIT trainings. Um, before coming here today, I actually participated in the CIT training in Montgomery County through our Adamus board. We do a, a couple of them throughout our 16-county catchment area, which is a really wonderful opportunity for us to develop those relationships with our law enforcement. And even today, you know, I've been attending these trainings for a couple of years now, um, I still get officers that are like, I don't really know how to access services at the VA. It feels like well, the VA is its own community over here and um, the rest of us are over here. And uh, so I think, you know, just having qu quick reference guides like that, those QR codes would really help bridge that gap so they're not feeling overwhelmed with the whole VA system. They just have, um, you know, they can literally keep it in their pocket or just scan it and save it on their phone. Um, just way to contact us directly. Um, I, I know that I'm working hard on developing those relationships so that way that immediately when an officer is engaging with a veteran that they can reach out to me and we can try to see what, what services that we can enhance for that person. So um, I think that's about it in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. So as she has stated, you know, working with the VA, sometimes they're siloed. And I, I got to the VA probably around 2016. So around 2017, I started getting all these phone calls. Hey, I have a veteran. I don't want to take him to jail. What do I do with him? And then a little light went in my head. Oh, no, we have this community that doesn't know what to do with veterans when they're in a crisis. So nationally, our National Police Academy had started a, I call it a deflection training for veterans in crisis. So Dr. Robinson and I, who's also my wife, if you haven't put the name together, is an Air Force veteran, and she's a director of trauma recovery, PTSD, and military sexual trauma. I'm like, hey, that would be a good partnership, right? So we attended the train the trainer. We came back. We got with some of our local first responders and says, hey, what do you need from us? How can we help you to help our veterans? So we kind of took our national training class, tweaked it for the needs of our central Ohio, Ohio area, and ever since 2018 was our first class in October, we've probably trained over 1,200 first responders, mental health clinicians, and now we've, we're kind of expanding out into all of Ohio. Whoever needs a training, we'll, we're more than happy to come out and train you. And with that, probably about a year ago, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Robinson to talk about our VMET that we came up with. So interacting with all the different law enforcement agencies, especially around Columbus, um, of course, one of the things with Columbus not being open 24 hours, they asked us a lot of questions about what do we do with veterans that we encounter. So kind of phase two, I guess, of, of this program, we developed a veterans mobile response team. We call it VMET. We pair um, a VA police officer with a clinician and we go out whenever the local law enforcement call us or need us. Um, sometimes it even, it's even fire departments. Um, if they've encountered a veteran that might be in crisis or if our suicide prevention team gets alerted or if a provider has a patient um, that they've just gotten a call from, we can go out and we can interact with that veteran, um, especially when it's law enforcement that's involved. Our primary goal is getting them connected to treatment, reconnected to treatment, um, back to our facility and not to a local hospital if they don't need to be and of course not to jail. So we've been partnering a lot with our Columbus Police Department. They have a mobile response team. Uh, so we partner a lot with them and um, it's for the last year, we recently just hired two social workers, so I was the only clinician, um, but now with two social workers on board, we'll be able to take more calls. Um, out of the Toledo CBOC, we cover 10 counties in Northwest Ohio, and currently BJP participates in CIT for two counties on a quarterly basis. Um, one of my colleagues came back from the national conference last year and he went running with the the qr code idea so we do have a qr code that we take to cit and and pass out to the police officers and our goal as a program through the ann arbor system the vjp program is directed at deflection and getting more engaged with police departments at a more of a deflection level versus the crisis intervention
Um, next thing I would just want to ask the panel, so whoever wants to discuss or answer this, um, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the deflection training that was held by the National VJP office. And I know one thing that was kind of surprising to me was hearing about some of the great efforts that we have already going on, but some of those connections were not being made. Some of our VA police were not aware of the, the efforts already going on with the VJP program. And and even our VJP specialists were not aware of the efforts that were already going on in the community. So this might be maybe directed to um, a doctor in Chief Robinson more so, but or anybody else who wants to answer. But what has changed with your efforts or the collaboration since that training? So I can go first. So when I attended the training, I knew the VA. I've been in the VA for 16 years now. I knew we had a VJO program. I knew what I thought their mission was, was to go into the jails and help veterans, but also learn that they have a mission after the fact that they can give them treatment and services up to a certain amount of time once they're re-entered back into the community, right? So once we got back, we, we took the training that we received down in Cincinnati. We developed a work group in Columbus, because like I mentioned a little bit ago, we were all siloed. VJO didn't know what I was doing as a police. I didn't know what she was doing for the community outreach effort. Now we're all, we got all the players in, in the same team with the work group and we're coming up with standardized documents, kind of standardized training, standardized reference sheets so we're all on the same page. If when somebody calls, we can refer them, hey, here's X, Y, and Z's phone number, they'll answer it. So we're trying to get a, lo a lot more collaborative and with our efforts in how to publish out information that's all the same for everybody. Okay, anybody else on the panel want to discuss anything on that? Um, Dr. Robinson, let me go to you as a treatment provider. Um, how do you see your, your job at the VA in helping with these deflection efforts? Well, so I think a lot of where I've come involved is just partnering with the police. Um, definitely, I work in trauma recovery, so PTSD is something that's talked about a lot out in the community in relation to veterans. So one, when I'm doing the education, it's just educating the law enforcement first responders on veterans, um, on what the diagnosis really looks like, what those symptoms are, and just to help them better understand part of VMET um, just allows me to go in the community and like I said I really don't want veterans to have to be um, involuntarily hospitalized so my goal is to avoid that at all costs so being able to interact with them and some of them uh, haven't been connected to our VA and being able to bring them back and show them all of the services we have available um, in our behavioral health department I, I really think that that's a help. Thank you. Okay. First, I'll put out to the audience. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask the panel? So, in your Columbus, when you were called out with law enforcement, how many times had you been called out? So, we started our program. We slowly roll, wrote it out eight or nine months ago. So, call outs has probably been around 15 to 18 because we're slowly rolling out. It took us nine months to get our independently licensed social worker on board who started three weeks ago, then our second one starts Monday. So Dr. Robinson, we kind of had to work around her clinical schedule if she was with patients or not, so she could go out with my investigator. So now that we have 16 mem members, counting myself and her, we will be able to roll out a whole lot more. And our goal is Columbus has a 13 county catchment area around Columbus. So especially in those rural counties where a lot of those resources are not available to help the veterans back to VA care too. I'll say the other piece is if we were not able to go out into the community, um, they did give us the report about what happened with that veteran, who that veteran was, and then we provided follow-up or connection if they had a provider um, to make sure that provider knew what was going on with them, could connect them, or we could reach back out and make sure they're connected with resources. How is this program working in the rural commu communities? How do you make this outreach effective for them, given the distance that, that they may be away from a VA facility and the different staffing levels and obligations they have in their local community? Like, it's like you said, a lot of the issues in the rural communities is, like Wyandotte County, it's probably or Marion's an hour drive from our Columbus VA. So a lot of times, and I think the furthest one we've had so far was up in Knox County, and kind of like with the VJO's program, if, if a first responder or fire or EMS has a veteran in crisis and they need vital information from us, we have a direct number that they can call. I can mobilize my team if they need assistance or we can give them assistance on the phone. 
a couple of months ago, we had a bar uh, barricaded hostage situation out in, was it Newark? Zanesville. Individual ended up being off of his psychotic medication and he had some other mental health issues going on. So we we're able to lay relay that information to the hostage negotiators that kind of helped them diffuse the situation because they, when they got there, they, they had no idea what was going on. And then after we kind of gave them a little bit of the medical history, they were able to use that to kind of help diffuse the situation. But our ultimate goal is if we're able to get there and if they need us to respond, we're gonna try, we know we're gonna try our best to get there in a timely manner and help as much as we can. And if we can't, we, we can help you over the phone, over video chat. My, our whole team has iPads, computers, so if they need to do telehealth to where they can talk back to a provider back at the VA, if we can get it there, we can do it that way also. So kind of like everybody up here talked about CIT training, Mo a lot of our training is also incorporated. We do it, we offer the two hour class in CIT training, but we're, we're willing to come out and just offer the training for anybody that wants it. It's free of charge. We, we don't charge, we're happy to do it. So if you, if you want training for your area, sir, reach out. We'll be more than happy to you know, arrange some dates and times and come out whenever you would like it. And the guidance that we're providing um, through our national trainings for the VA staff is really focused on the importance of one of the last things that I mentioned, which is being very clear about what resources are available and that that's gonna be a geographically specific conversation. And so if, a, if a, one of our teams is talking to a partner in a county that's 90 minutes away, that needs to be part of the upfront you know, one of the earliest topics of discussion is that the options for an immediate connection to a VA resource, it'll depend um, about what the options are for transportation, the nature of the encounter, uh, whatever the case might be. But we can't, the, the thing that we have to avoid is making a uniform promise that wherever you are, whenever you are, you can immediately uh, connect someone to a VA treatment resource. That may not be practical just logistically. We may be talking to a county that they can't spare the patrol unit to bring someone all the way to the nearest VA facility, um, uh, to name just one example of a potential barrier. So it's the, it's the clarity uh, of the communication and the, the upfront planning work that needs to happen within VA to determine what are we in a position to put out there as far as our, our commitment um, and that we know for 100% certainty that we can back up and that we can deliver consistently. Um, but then the conversation goes from there. Every one of our facilities, every one of our teams that's getting trained across the system can offer something. Um, these conversations may start in different places with different partners, but um, there will all be places, something to build on. Um, but again, geography, that's real. And we can't, um, you know, we can't paper over that. Um, there will be differences um, in what's possible, you know, certainly as far as an immediate response capability, depending on where you're looking in the system. And I'll just add to that a little bit, too, that we've had um, some very creative um, practices in our network. So, again, we have Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan, where some of our VJP specialists will um, partner with their local law enforcement to provide trainings so they can get education credits. So whether it's police officers or probation officers or judges or attorneys or what it may be to start kind of those connections. And as the Robinsons mentioned, like Columbus VA is an outpatient clinic. So 8 to 4.30 or whatever their hours, that's it, Monday through Friday. So they don't have a hospital, they don't have anything after hours, so they've had to get creative on um, that. But we, even with that, we still have other VAs that don't have hospitals or inpatient units. So that's really where we kind of depend on our VA police that is there 24-7 to make those connections and then, you know, then work with the VJP specialist to be able to connect up the next business day to help follow up. So uh, the Toledo CBOC, like I said, services 10 counties in Ohio. Only one county is significantly um, urban, which is would be Lucas County. Um, separately, we partnered with the, the VA itself. Uh, community engagement program coordinators have been a great resource for us in the BJP program. And one of the community engagement coordinators partnered with uh, local community agency who Jer Jeremy Parkins runs and he's gonna um, talk later on today, but he then got together several counties, I believe it was like eight or six, six counties, two other partners. to try to pool resources in those rural counties. So that's been helpful and that's in early development. Um, so just, I guess, think just bringing other counties together and partnering with them, knowing what you already have out there because Toledo does not have an emergency room at the 
outpatient clinic. And then in Lucas County, um, we have two partners that are here today through one of the community mental health agencies that's willing to engage in the deflection efforts as well as in the partnership with us. And for those that didn't catch um, with Christy, what she was saying though too, is her main VA is in Ann Arbor. So she's a whole nother state that she has to work with in order to coordinate things. So her main VA is in another state which means the veterans may not be able to cross state lines or different things like that. So that's a whole nother dynamic to some of the efforts too that she has to work with. Any other questions? We're trying to keep on time here. Yep. I just wanted to clarify, Dr. Robinson, did you say VMED, like Victor, Mike, Echo Delta? VMET, V-M-E-T. T, thank you. Um, my other question is, um, for law enforcement, do they have something like squares that they can uh, verify that someone's veteran, like on the spot? We have access to records, too, that can tell you if they're a veteran or not. If it's, uh, depends on the situation and what the information is needed for, we can, there's different types of information my, our, the VA police can supply to you. Yeah, we well go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Clark. He can speak yeah, a little bit sure. on squares a little and bit. And squares is, I'm glad you brought it up because it's a, a VA tool that draws on the same source data that VRSS does, the system that we heard quite a bit about earlier. One of the key differences is that squares can deliver a result immediately, um, uh, within about a minute. Um, I should say, not immediately, within about a minute, still pretty good. Um, but less than the turnaround time for VRSS, which can run two hours. So two hour turnaround isn't a problem if you're a, a prison facility with a stable population. Um, but if you're, you've got someone in front of you right now, you're having the encounter, you need the answer in the moment. Um, and so for law enforcement uh, uh, partners, we think Squares is you know, just gonna be a structurally better fit um, for them because of that immediate response capability. But it can do exactly that. Um, with uh, basic demographics uh, fed into it, uh, it can answer questions. It can actually provide more information. Um, than VRSS can to an external user. Um, it does require uh, an MOU and a data use agreement up front uh, to get established to use it because VA is able to uh, make additional disclosures uh, once those agreements are in place. Um, but it, it provides uh, confirmation of veteran status, character of discharge, um, and probable eligibility uh, for, for VA healthcare and other VA services. So quite a bit of useful information at your fingertips within about a minute um, once you get up and running with the Square system. So thank you for bringing that up. Hi, Sean. I hope it's okay if I ask you a question about VRSS. We, we had talked a, a year ago about automating um, some of the VRSS uploads for local courts because of the administrative burden involved in that. R recently, we were talking to a um, case management vendor named DIMS. They had, they had said that they were working with the VA to automate the, the upload, the download. Could you confirm that? To automate the downloads? Yeah, so they, they said that within their system, they could upload uh, arraignment data and then organize the result of the VRSS out feed back to the court. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about that. I'm not, I'm not sure what that's referring to, but let's talk after. Okay, great, thanks. thanks. Any other questions? I know there's been a lot of discussion about creating mobile crisis teams, but I know that there's some already in place. Like we already have one for Lucas County. So has any of you guys already tapped into existing mobile crisis teams that exist and building off their structure? So here in Columbus, Columbus has a, I think six or 18 mobile crisis units. So we actually teamed with Sergeant Matt Harris, who's their supervisor for the team as we kind of developed ours in the model that we were using. So I can't take credit for developing it for the VA. Long Beach, California created the first mobile crisis veterans response team. We were the third in the country. So we kind of took their, their model and then incorporated as we had meetings with Columbus to kind of see what the best practices was to create ours. Because a lot of times when you have local mobile crisis response, they're, they're there for the crisis. 
while they do have veterans on their team, they're just there, you know, they'll take them back to the local community hospital or wherever they take them, but then they don't have that follow-up piece until the hospital contacts the VA. Part of our team is to, as we do outreach, say, say for instance, Columbus goes out and does a health and welfare check, their team will notify my team. They'll send us an email, hey, I went out to veteran X, Y, and Z. This is what we saw him for. This is where he went. And then we'll look in the, or Dr. Robinson will do the clinical assessment, send the information to that person's provider so they can follow up with it. Thank you. Just to add, we're lucky though here at Lucas County for our mobile crisis teams, they're a CCBHC. So they already have an established agreement with the VA. So just, I'll follow up with them and make sure like deflection and everything's kind of cohesive. So, I, so addressing the, the question about uh, access for, for crisis, so one of the things just, to, and I'm not an expert on this uh, item, but there were some recent changes legislatively authorizing the VA to pay third parties that are providing services to veterans in a crisis. So if a veteran is in a crisis and they can't get access to the VA, they can go to a local facility, get that emergency care. Um, and the VA will cover that care. Um, so again, there's a lot of pieces that are involved in that and, and get But one of the questions I'll have for the panel um, is how are you addressing, what are some things that you're doing internally to help with messaging and help with connecting the community resource, the community law enforcement folks who are bringing or messaging to veterans, come to the VA to make sure that when that VA veteran does show up, that they're getting the care that they receive. Because the last thing we don't want, we don't want to see veterans uh, over, over promising and under delivering. We want to under promise and over deliver. So can anybody address what you're doing on that front? Sure, I mean, I, I know for me anyway, it's just really nothing magical in a sense to where there's something I'm doing differently. It's just kind of, you know, pound the pavement. I mean, when, you, when we're talking about, uh, the topic of uh, deflection, I mean, like, like it's been stated multiple times, it's really, it, there's nothing really sexy about it. it, it you're, you're not going to, you know, they're not going to make a movie about it. It's as simple as passing out business cards when you come in contact with various law enforcement. It's, uh, uh, I'm on various committees. I know I'm on with Judge Loxley. I think I spoke recently on his uh, committee call uh, about uh, the Compact Act and, and, and just, it's just the relationships. You either have it in your personality or you don't, right? I mean, and there's, it's kind of like an intangible thing, I guess. So for, for, for me, I mean, I feel like I do it all the time. Uh, as a VJO, I know that uh, when, when Teresa trained me and, and I came through the ranks, you know, when you're a VJO, you, you're essentially, you're, you're an ambassador to the VA and you need to look at it like that. So when you're out in the community, 90% of my work, I'm not in a hospital. So people, you know, don't naturally always assume that I'm a VA person. So sometimes I have to engage them and let them know that I'm a you know uh, independently licensed social worker at the VA. Uh, this is what I do, uh, and and just kind of spark their interest and, and kind of go from there. I mean, just just simply doing that alone has led me to multiple phone calls and and multiple things. I know Diane. I know you know. Uh, I recently reached out to somebody about uh, setting up an MLP f at the VA, and that just happened because I just, hey, how are you, oh, you're an attorney. And I know that we're uh, scheduled, hopefully, well, assuming we can hammer it down, uh, the first week of December to get a medical legal partnership at our VA as well. So um, it, it's just, you know, you just gotta pound the pavement and shake the tree and see what falls. I know that that's, that's my secret, if you wanna call it a secret, I and mean, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's kinda, I know that's what I'm doing. And I just want to share real quick, too, that um, so with our deflection efforts that Mr. Clark was sharing, that's that the VA is going out and training all the sites. Um, so Vizin, our, our network was one of the first ones, but the, the VAs are being charged with like, deflection efforts out. And some of our VAs in our network, that's the first thing that they're doing is working on their internal processes to make sure that we don't, because you just, we, we heard from several police officers there even that if you, that you just need one, one time where you overpromise and don't deliver and that's where it's gonna get out and nothing's gonna go move forward. So some of the VAs, that's what their first efforts are is making sure that they can, whatever they can promise, they're going to deliver. So that, again, that under promising, over delivering. Does anybody else have, want to respond to that? I see Diane's got a question over there too, or a comment. 
kind of wanted to pack, uh, piggyback on what Paige is saying. You know, I think the su success to all of this is about, uh, yes, developing relationships, but how do relationships start? They start with creating intimacy with your partners, your community partners. I think one of the things in Dayton that our VJO team has done, um, they were tasked with creating a strategic plan. And so one of the things that they will be doing across next year is going out, we identify that one of the goals was when he's talking about, the judge was talking about the rural areas, which we know uh, legal things look different, they go different in smaller uh, counties. I can say that I'm from the great state of Mississippi, so things are a little bit, uh, uh, you know, in smaller states, a little bit different, but uh, that intimacy is, it's one thing you pass out a QR, a QR card, but face-to-face -face is what brings the success of these programs and, have, and establishing those intimate relationships with those key partners, those key law enforcement, sheriff's departments, local police departments. So um, they're going to be going out into those rural areas and introducing themselves, having those meetings with them, as I said, to create that intimacy, which leads to success. And we've done that on VA grounds with our VA police, with other providers, our psych inpatient unit, our ER, uh, our mental health providers know us. So you've got to put yourself out there and, uh, you know, make your uh, program and your services known. You know, people say, what do VA do? Well, let me tell you what VA does. This is what we do. And we go out. I know we need to start wrapping up here. I think it's about break time, too. Um, so any other last-minute questions or anything from the panel? So I will, I will thank the panel. So a lot of them did not know they were going to get to speak today. So again, that relationships and who I can grab up here last minute. So thank you to all the panelists.